In this episode, we're going to take you through a case study of a couple who are looking for their ideal sea change home on the New South Wales South Coast. But they started their search before COVID hit and had no idea the market would run on them. What are their options now? Or have they missed the boat? Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. Now, we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists that you can download, a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Now we've got a new workshop that we're bringing to you. It's the Stepping Stone Strategy Workshop. We're running this live, online live. Uh, online live, <laughs> online interactive. Live. <laughs> on Saturday, 19th of June from two o'clock in the afternoon. And you get to do the workshop, but also ask us loads of questions. Looking forward to it. I'm quite excited about this one actually, because we ran a poll and we asked people, what do you want from us next? What part of our brain do you want to pick? And it was rent firsting versus stepping stone strategy and more than double the amount of people wanted the stepping stone strategy. So if you want to make sure that your first property does the heavy lifting to make sure that your dream home will be achievable in the future, then the Stepping Stone Strategy Workshop is the place to come to get the foundation steps right so that you get that first purchase on the ladder right and then can step towards the dream home. Now, to find out more, look at homebuyeracademy.com.au forward slash SSW. It's that simple, but we will put the link in the show notes. These live workshops, we only do them a few times a year and they're Mm -hmm. fantastic. So please join us. We received a very detailed question from one of our listeners, and we thought it would make a very good case study. So especially given that so many of us are migrating away from our cities to the regional areas. So we've changed a few details to protect their privacy, and we're going to call them Pip and Dave. (laughs) Great. Here's a bit of the background of what they sent us. And there was a lot in here, Veronica, so we have cut it down a little bit. But the key things were they returned to Australia a couple of years ago after living overseas for quite a long time and they had what they thought was enough cash in the bank and really, really believed that they would have no problem finding their dream home with a budget of a million dollars. Whenever they looked at listings on the coast where they were interested, it seemed that finding something really nice was in the you know, five hundred dollars to $700,000 range. So they really believed it was quite doable. No kids, just the two of them. They love nature, uh, like to spend as much time outside enjoying the trails, the beaches and the, wi- uh, the wildlife around. So automatically I can see one little problem that a lot of buyers fall into and you probably will nod when I start saying this, you probably thought about yourself, Megan, and that is when you start your search looking online. It all seems very affordable at it first, does doesn't it? It does seem so doable, <laughs> doesn't it? Oh, my God, there's at least 20 options for us. How are we going to choose? <laughs> <laughs> Especially because they did actually, they were looking before COVID, of course, and we all do know that, that property markets across the country have gone a bit gangbusters. So a combination of factors, I think that they may well have actually had plenty of money to do what they wanted beforehand. But it is a trap that a lot of people fall into, particularly in areas where you're looking where there's a price guide, not the actual asking price, you know, because 
If there's an oh, asking, it just comes up in the search range, Veronica. Yes. I mean, it's a really difficult one for people to wrap their heads around. There might be a price guide, but if there's no price on it, which can be the case sometimes, and you've just put in your search, you know, between 500 and 700,000 and all of these properties come up, yeah. um, the parameters that are in the background or the back end of that search don't necessarily mean that property is going to be available to buy in that price range. Exactly. So their initial dream home would have been a house on one of the cliffs uh, with a nearby path down to the beach. It sounds oh, magical, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking the New South Wales South Coast. So we're talking down that sort of Marimbula, I guess, Ulladulla, Naruma, all those areas. They wanted to watch the whales from their balcony or patio. It would have been amazing, and I agree. Oh, no, and sounds so good. <laughs> she's saying that she's not sure they've ever been realistic, but from the look at the sales history, at, you know, when they started their, their um, search, so they didn't just look at what was on the market, which is good. Um, it certainly might have been, but I think obviously that lulled them into a bit of a false sense of security, you know, that they I thought they could really take good- their time. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that they actually looked at sold history, not just what was on the market. Um, that's your more risk, realistic guidance, depending on how old the sales are. You know, if they're, yes. if they're 12 months <laughs> old, you, you, you might have missed the boat on that one. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> actually true because quite often, you know, I've looked in in real estate um, and also domain at sold data and I thought, oh, my God, how did I miss that one? And then I've realised <laughs> it's five years old. <laughs> So, oh, it was a bargain in 2012. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would have been it was this year for sure. <laughs> so we continue on with their story. Do you want to continue on there, Megan? Uh, okay, so after exploring the strip from Kayama to Marimbula, they narrowed down their search to Kayama, Vincentia, Vinci, Vincentia, is that Vincentia, how Vincentia, it's beautiful. Thank you. White and sand Molly is gorgeous. Moore. Actually, well, that's high speed. Flyer saving in um, in Molly Milk. Did you? Uh, yeah, just a competition. Yeah, um, <clears throat> decades ago, <laughs> uh, our timing couldn't have been worse, and it doesn't look like we're going to get enough. I have enough to get in the game. I mean, you know, disheartening to say the least when you think you've got more than enough and then it turns out you haven't got anywhere near enough. Yeah. And they're, they're feeling really gutted, but they also realise um, it is what it is, which I really love. So they're not trying to fight the market they're they're becoming aware of you can't fight you can't you can't hope that something pops up and and blows you away um but there isn't they also realize they can't do anything differently so they can't go back to pre-covid and buy a property you just you can't go backwards you can't reverse so as as pip says i'll live and learn with it um and 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 a lot of people are so after there's, there's a little bit of distraction they've obviously had and a lot of people had these distractions too you know there was fires down south and then covid and and like a lot of people they didn't really fathom the full depth of what was going on in the market um and it caught a lot of people by surprise so they're certainly not alone in that um, uh, they were busy exploring the towns up and down the coast and actually enjoy, enjoying the lazy beach life. Uh, you know, they didn't really kind of realise <laughs> what was happening in the real world um, by the time they'd seen enough to settle on their top three picks. They began to hear from agents that they were a little bit late to the game. Which is really horrific. But the great thing is they're now they're making up for lost time in the sense that they're saying, right, well, we need to find out what our options are. We need to mm. actually start learning. We need to. And so they've been listening to the podcast, which is fabulous. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's step one really is facing reality. You know, a lot of people will actually fool themselves for years and we'll, we'll sort of get to that, this idea of going, oh, well, I'll just wait until the market goes back to where it used to be, which is. And we do hear that, don't we? You know, should I sit it out for six months and wait until the heat goes out of the market? Um, and, oh, Veronica, it's such a hard one because you and I haven't got crystal balls and we don't ever pretend that we know what's going to be happening in 12 months, but we can look at what buyer behaviour is and what levels of stock are and number of listings and and all of those things, the supply and demand side of the equation, and and neither of us in, in our marketplace or in the regional marketplace where we're talking to a lot of buyers agents, none of us are seeing a change in that inequity of high demand, low supply, which is the, the one of the key drivers to price growth. The big 
there's a number of issues and, and one is, it's funny, I was listening to Alan Kohler, you know, he's the mm. um, ABC finance journalist and, and last night he was saying there's not an affordability problem. The problem is that houses are too affordable because money is too cheap. I Interest rates are so low, therefore more people can afford to borrow. So that's why we've got a problem with rising prices. It's it's mm. that we can afford it. That's the problem. If we couldn't afford yeah. it, prices wouldn't, wouldn't rise. Yeah. And so when you've got a lot of these regional areas, you've got a lot of Sydney money and Melbourne money and Canberra money, particularly in the south coast of New South Wales, it's Sydney and, Mel- and Canberra money, who is going into these areas with Sydney and Canberra jobs, you know? And so that is taking um, higher budgets into areas that typically didn't have people with the same earning capacity buying property mm. down there. Yeah. And yeah, so like borrowing capacity. Yeah. And so therefore, you know, as soon as the quicker you can face up to reality, the quicker you can actually Mm. come up with your plan B, which we will come to a little bit further on in this podcast, is what sort of things can you consider? Because, you know, this one of the um, properties that uh, that Pip had looked at, um, she came onto the market, it sold, I have to quickly look up the link now because I forgot forgot <laughs> what it sold for. But it sold back in 2018, right, for, I'm scrolling down, look at $805,000 in November 2018. Two years later, doesn't look like much had been done to it. It sold for $1.2 million. So that's a 50% gain in two years. So you can understand why, you know, Pip's looking and researching now and now getting it coming to grips with how fast things are moving and it mm. you know it must be horrific and and absolutely you know it, it just takes away your self confidence and your and your your dream sometimes to think if only i had but going back to pip's earlier point you know what what is is um, and you can't go back backwards. You can't lament what you didn't do at any point in time. But you can start from now, and and I think that's a really key thing that we want. I, I guess we spoke to uh, Matthew Ward yesterday. Sorry, episode twenty one uh, <laughs> last week. Um, <laughs> it shows we record Matthew. these in batches, guys. <laughs> it won't surprise you. Um, and uh, and and his point was was really quite crucial. It's you know this is happening all over the place. You can't go backwards. You can only start from now. But if you don't start now, then you're going to be looking in twelve months' time to start and saying, I wish I had started 12 months ago. Mm. I actually was just reflecting on it today, actually, that, you know, this this idea of um, if you sit on your hands and prices go down, then, yeah, great, lucky you. But that's not as likely to happen, particularly in the current cycle, as prices going up. And so if you sit on your hands, you've got a higher probability of never getting into the market Whereas if you buy, even if prices go down, as long as you bought a really good asset, a really good house in a good location and didn't panic and buy crap, which we'll talk about, um, you know, you, you'll always have a home, you know. Yeah. So, so that's the upside of, of buying in a hot market if you can afford to buy. And so this is their challenge. What can they afford to buy and where can they afford to buy? Mm. And they've been looking around and I guess the biggest and harshest um, thing that they're going to conf- uh, confront themselves with is that dream of overlooking the ocean and watching the whales. Yeah. Yeah. That might be a little picnic you have on an evening <laughs> <laughs> and you go for a drive. It might be a short walk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or a short drive. Actually, <laughs> I, I think there's, um, I didn't actually watch it, but there is a show on Foxtel which is about beach compromises and it's, you know, with a set budget do you choose the the one that's right on the beach and you 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 can see but it's smaller do you choose the one that's further away but you know you've got to walk a little bit so you know like everything and 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 certainly our our where to buy tutorial is a, a good one for forcing um the compromises and and making decisions around which compromises are right but the the the, the compromise is well maybe it is right next to the beach but you can't actually see it or maybe it is with a view but it's much you know much smaller or an apartment or or maybe it is half a kilometre away and you're going to increase your fitness walking to the beach to have the picnic to to watch the whales. Um, and that's something that that if you've got a fixed budget, 
they're the kinds of questions that you've got to ask yourself if a sea change is what you're really, really focused on. Um, and, and, you know, these these guys are, this is the dream. This is they've worked overseas, they saved their money, they they sold property over there and, and um, finding that right level of compromise. We're going to talk a little bit more about some of the things they're looking at and then what their options are. Um, so there was, there was another one that they looked at um, if they dropped their expectations a little bit and focused on a really nice um, reserve area that led down to the beach. So they weren't actually looking at the beach. Um, the, the, they're, they're, they sort of noticed that prices appeared to drop a little bit and they found one that sold for just over a million dollars. Um, so that was a compromise that at the t- time they weren't ready to make, but now they're starting to say, all right, well, maybe if we can't see the beach, is this something that we can fit into our budget? Uh, but it's still pushing over the million too there, isn't it? Yeah, and it's funny because she sort of mentioned that she said an example of what she wouldn't let FOMO talk them into. And this is a delicate thing, isn't it? Because you can say, I don't want to buy just anything and that's sort of what FOMO leads you to do. But by saying I'm not going to pounce because I don't want to, it's sort of I don't want to give up on my dream and it's painful, but the quicker you accept you have to give up on some aspects of your dream. You have to rebrand the dream, which is good that they have a revised dream home. (laughs) 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 But speed is of the essence. And I think that that's the thing. When you've got a fast moving market, you've got to come to grips with these things very, very quickly and make your mind up very, very quickly and realize that it's not necessary. Well, I I guess you've got to take yourself FOMO out of it that, um, and, and realize that that there's a difference between panicking and buying just anything and actually revising your expectations in line with your budget and the market. There's a, there's a big difference between those big two difference. things. Yep. One is in control and the other one is with a complete lack of control. And we see that. It's almost like the blinkers come on and, and, and it, you know, under the pressure, particularly in negotiating when people haven't really thought through, and, and this is a danger where I see it a lot and you probably see it a lot too, Megan, that, that buyers, you know, when they miss out a few times or they see prices rising and they panic that it's going to be out of their price bracket, they forget to price every property and work out what each property is worth and they just go in with their budget. And it's like yes. when I ask people, I say, how did you work out what you should pay for that? And they go, well, I don't know, it's just the market was so hot, I just threw my budget just at pu- it. Pu- threw, threw the kitchen sink at it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you, but you didn't have to. And actually, you know. <laughs> and you do, you see that in prices, Veronica. We were talking about one today and it was a property, a renovator in in Cannon Hill, so a Queenslander on about 700 square metres, so not a bad block of land. Cannon Hill gets quite a lot of aircraft noise over it. The, power, the runways run over the top of it um, <laughs> and at a quite low level as well. So prices have been held back there mainly for that reason. Um, but this property shouldn't, shouldn't have been more than around 900. So had some good bones, needed some work, good residential street, walked to the train station, the shops. Um, that sold on the first first day so the first lot of people that went through paid 1.175 for it now Ooh. they paid 1.7175 because that was their budget mm. the, the agent was really quite shocked themselves and said you know there was no way we could not the owner could not accept that because they just threw every single thing at it and comparables were around 900 so that's what not to do what not to mm. do is give up and think that price do- at the pricing a property and the value doesn't matter um, and throw your budget at it. That is absolutely what not to do. I'll give you another example. We we literally last night bought a home for some clients, a young family, got two very small children. And we have been looking at them for some time, I have to say. They, they and and their board their budget was borderline at the beginning. And it was just before the market took off and it was like, right, we're playing catch up. So they were great. They were very responsive and went back and refined, you know, got more access to more money and they they always had the capacity and so that that they realized they needed it right mm. and so i'd sat down with them and said look we're going to have to we're going to have to consider making all these compromises we're going to have to consider a townhouse not a house we're going to have to consider if you want a house a two bedroom home that you can a big one that you can actually add value to you over time the, these are the sorts of things that that we we look through or you might consider moving a different area and the area was completely out of the question that was like right. I was <laughs> so that's their non negotiable right that was their non negotiable so therefore the property had to had to budge now, 
Now, interestingly enough, we um, we did go for property a couple of weeks ago, and they didn't didn't get it. But it did. The negotiations got to a point where I knew they could have afforded that property, and I think they were sort of getting to a point where they'll get to just throw the budget at it. I didn't care. And both Camilla, one of my team, and I, we both said, "No, you can't." You know, you cannot do that. And we really set a hard line for them, you know, which is a bit dangerous. You're telling client, don't, don't pay that money. Don't. don't. Yeah, but it, yeah. it was a lovely home internally. It did have a very, very small outdoor space. And that was, that was like the compromise I prepared to live with. And everyone has to have compromises. But in this particular case, somebody or just else just kept pushing. Last night we were, we were in the same situation. There's competitive offers someone surely tempted to throw their entire limit at this property and we bought it, but it was so much better for them. It's bigger. It's got more outdoor space. It's in a location that works for them better. Everything. The only reason that I think it was in their budget was because behind them is like a low rise block of units. And all they need to do is plant bamboo along their bed back friends. Like that's all they need to do. I cannot believe nobody done it before. It's not that big. It's actually, and we got it and we got it for only 50,000 more than the other house that they that sold the other week. It's so much better. And in the whole scheme of things, we're talking a lot more money than a lot of first home buyers have got because we're mm. talking Sydney. But the principle is that it was worth waiting. It was worth waiting. They could have afforded that other house. for it. Yeah. yeah yep. Absolutely. Now, Patience, that's about not realistic not yes. making the decision so the, i think there's a difference between patience and inaction yes <laughs> and 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 that's a really big differentiation to make because i unfortunately have have heard people in recent times going it'll happen when it's meant to happen oh no <laughs> nothing does that <laughs> i'm sorry but nothing happens when it meant is meant to happen except rain uh, yeah. <laughs> no Dawn, sunshine <laughs> <laughs> and not, you know, but you can't influence those things, but pretty much everything else in life, if you want something to happen, you've got to put the plans in place and have the strategy and have the, the approach and have the right, you know, steps along the way to actually make it happen yourself. No one is going to ring you and say, look what I've just found. It is the perfect house for you and it's in your budget. It's a lot They're of hard work not. and a lot of research and a lot of market knowledge. And that's it, what's required here with Pip and Dave. Mm. Mm. That, and they are doing it now, but you can see how they would have been pretty relaxed <laughs> pre-COVID, you know. Sounds sounds like a pretty crazy approach initially. So <laughs> and they, they, not then go, <laughs> they then go then go on to talk about um their most southerly um area that they're looking at is Mollymook. Uh and Pip visited seven agents there and got the same reaction from each one when she told them her ceiling budget, which is they weren't very helpful at all because they probably have dozens and dozens and dozens of buyers with a million dollars wanting beachfront with views. So that's what you're competing with. They do. And look in, you know, deep down in one of these emails that Pip sent me, there's, she did say that they were starting to look further out, further away where the Sydney siders and the Canberrans aren't necessarily going to mm-hmm. go because it's too much of a commute. And that for them will work because they don't need to commute. So, and that, that is a very good thing to do next to really expand out your location. Cause we talk about in the where to buy workshop, we talk about the three P's, the location, the, the property itself. So those compromise you have to make on the property. So that's really not having a view, not being a walk to the beach, you know, maybe, maybe a, a bit less renovated. instead of a house, maybe exactly. two bedrooms instead of three bedrooms, those sorts of things are the property aspects of it. Yeah. And then there's a the position, that's the location aspect of it. So that's about moving further away from uh, in terms of lo- uh, suburb or, or actual town, you know, to a different town. So that's definitely, and I'd, I'd be speeding that process up for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's price. And then there's price. So if price is fixed. Now, the thing is with these guys, they've come back with a big chunk of cash. So I would be talking to a broker and I'd be saying, and I don't know their working situation, but I'd be saying, is there a way they could actually borrow and have a small mortgage? Is there yeah. is there a way that, that you know, even if it's a 10-year mortgage? Because mm. these mm. guys, look, they're not your typical first-home buyers. And, and, look, I'll let you in on a little secret, listeners. Um, they're some, some of our first-home buyers that do Home Buyer Academy aren't actually first-home buyers. So you don't have to be a first-home buyer to do it. But they're first-home buyers in Australia. Australia. Yeah. And so it's all new. 
it's a it's a whole new ball game. But so they're very fortunate they don't have to borrow the money. Um, and maybe that's an answer for them. And and likewise with the first home buyer who's potentially trying to buy with a 20% deposit in a rising market, looking at whether you can actually borrow more and borrow with and buy with a 10% deposit is a very valid exercise. I'm not saying you should do it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, but you need to it's know all about opening up the options and then yeah. making decision with options. And and I want to I want to move on to this because this is a really big one, Veronica, that is kind of getting to me and I want, it's grating me and I need to get to it. Uh, (laughs) Get to it then. (laughs) I do need to. Um, So as an example of what they wouldn't let FOMO talk them into, as in what compromise they wouldn't be prepared to Mm. make just because of the pressure, they found a nice place in walking distance to the beach but a little too compact for them. Um, But most importantly, it's a villa and it's on a small block of land. They're, they're kind of guessing it was subdivided. The price is definitely right, but from all the advice I've heard recently, it would be best to avoid it. Question. Who gave advice? Is that your question? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like. Who gave blanket advice that a villa is not a valid option? Yeah. Or should be best avoided. Like who was that that gave them that advice? What was it the person who owns a big block of land who that you know they bought 15 years ago and land is, you know, you know, those people that oh, you've got to buy land the is land. Where the land value is, is where the value is, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yes, land is where the capital appreciation generally comes from, but it depends on your stage in life. It depends mm. on what your your um, emotional needs are. It, it depends on how you're going to live in the property. So so again, going back to that where to buy tutorial. Actually considering a townhouse or a villa or a unit to as the compromise on the property side of things to get, keep your position um, in, in your ideal location is a valid exercise to go through. You might arrive at the decision that it's not the right compromise for you, but it is a really valid, valid process to go through without the input of somebody else telling you that blanket villas are no good. Yeah. It's, it's so true, isn't it? Because the thing is, unless you explore all these different options, you don't really know what the right one is for you. And that's where the where to buy workshop is so powerful, but you know, in this particular instance, and one thing, one thing we always talk about with units and townhouses and villas is, well, you got to watch for oversupply. So if there's only a handful of them in an area, then knock yourself out because that's an affordable opportunity. The other thing too, as land becomes more valuable, it's more likely to be subdivided. Um, because that's, you know, there's, there's high demand to live in certain areas. And so people will put up with smaller properties on smaller blocks in order to live in a certain location. So that is an absolutely valid option. Mm -hmm. And I encourage you, if that one hasn't sold yet to go and have a good look at it. Yeah. And, and do that, do that stress test on yourself. If I didn't compromise on location to be close to the beach and I can't move my budget, is this something that, you know, I, I can put a study in or, you know, an extra area. Is there enough room for, you know, could you add an extra story? All of those sorts of things if it was in budget. But is this something that I would actually make a compromise on to have the lifestyle aspect that I want, which is the walk to the beach? So they've got a revised dream home now, which they say <laughs> is a two or three bedroom house on an established and very quiet tree line street. Ideally, they'd like some sort of view, whether it's a far away one of the ocean and um, or a hilltop overlooking a forest or valley, uh, or simply a yard that backs onto some lush bush reserved lands. And there are plenty of hinterland areas in those um, suburbs and, and the hinterland of those um coastal towns that should offer those sorts of opportunities and they're well worth investigating. But the thing is that when you're actually looking at something with a view over land, you need to check what the zoning of that land that you're looking at is and what potentially it could turn into one be. day. Will it always be a nice outlook or could it be <laughs> something else? Will it be, it will always be kangaroos, possums and, and um, uh, koalas up the trees or will it be backyard neighbours with kids screaming and, and trampolines? <laughs> and I have, I have those children, so I'm not having a go at it. You don't want to be your neighbour. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's a very different lifestyle <laughs> to have, you know have, mm-hmm. have a block of units behind you suddenly or a, a large housing subdivision so you know key key thing is to look into that um and how easy it is for a council to change the zoning so it might be zoned rural at the moment but could it change easily and is does one um side of of council lean towards development and rezoning more than another side of council it could be yeah. important to consider as well there are some councillors that are very pro development and some who aren't and you know one might get one might be in power the greens might be in power now and then the libs might get in and all of a sudden you know all this lovely everything national... gets subdivided yeah yeah <laughs> no, sorry. what you thought was national park isn't well, we're national not talking park. politics here but <laughs> no. you know just generally speaking <laughs> well but but councils do change and yes. um the other thing too is that um you know, you, you do need to understand all the local dynamics and, and going down the pub and, and learning all that stuff from the locals is a really good thing to check out. Such a good source of information, isn't it? To, to have a chat, you know, at the coffee shop or go to the pub and, and listen to what people are saying. That's rumour. Then you go and verify. Mm. Um talking to real estate agents about what's going on, who's doing what. They love to talk about what, what's <laughs> going on. That's rumour. Go go then and verify. So sourcing all of this information is great. You then want to verify it and see how it applies or doesn't apply to your situation because some of these things, it doesn't really matter. And development is going to happen and there's going to be progress and there's going to be more people and pressure on on resources and infrastructure. So so things are going to change, um, but but it's it's really, you know, the, the, the locals will tell you what's getting up their nose they they will be very quick to you know, oh yeah to, to, to point out what, what they're not happy about and and then you can go and see if it matters to you and and whether that impacts your decision or not it's probably facebook groups too so oh, that's good point that's, yeah, yeah, the yeah community yeah. groups there's some, some absolute gold in some of those <laughs> <Isn't there ever? laughs> you, you can verify what the agent is telling you against the facebook group <laughs> so they're keeping an open mind and we've got a couple of specific questions we're going to answer um, in a moment. But so she finishes this sort of the big, long background because I asked for some background, big, long background saying that they're keeping an open mind, but maybe rent vesting might end up being their only opportunity. And I guess for them, I would actually suggest it wouldn't be their only opportunity. I think they've got some other avenues to go down. And given that they, uh, you know, it's not, whilst it's their first property in Australia, they're not at that beginning of their property ownership journey. And they used to, where they lived before overseas, they did have a small apartment. So they have, uh, they're a different stage of their life. So I'm not necessarily thinking rent vesting is the answer. And in fact, they she's already sort of come back with a bunch of her particular fears around being, um, having to rent for a the rest of, tenant. yeah, being a long-term tenant, which, mm. You know, I think they're quite they're quite relevant fears too. And I think so if we talk about those, and I think that there's still options for them to buy their home. So I wouldn't be rushing to rent versus if I was them. Yeah, yeah, good point. What, one of the things, Veronica, that we talked about when we we're looking at this case study is I guess what finding the property is one thing. Um, but but the, one of the questions that Pip asked was, how do buyers juggle making an offer without paying too much when it's you know a, a hot market as mm. Pip called it? Um, it's such a good question because you and I are experiencing two very very different scenarios in our buyers agency businesses at the moment, um, and and both but both of us are experiencing loss in making offers. Um, and and having to make multiple offers on different properties for for clients in in circumstances where we might you know only find one option for them in a, in a couple of months. So, what what what's your advice there when when someone has found a property that they like, they've done their research, they've verified the information, they've gathered all the information, they've understood their compromises, they're comfortable with them, they know the pros and cons, and uh, they're looking to make an offer, whether that's private treaty or set a limit to go to an auction. How, what, what, what's sort of the process that they can go through to, to arrive at what's a reasonable figure without throwing the, the budget and the kitchen sink at it? <laughs> well, the first thing, of course, you can download our free course. with the, We have a free mini course on how to price a property. <laughs> but 
But I think what Do. you're gonna I think what you're <laughs> gonna say next, and we will put the link in the show, show notes if you haven't already downloaded that. It's free for it's God's free. sake. Download mm. it and learn how to actually price a property. But of course, what you're saying here and what what uh, Pip and Dave are saying is that. The prices are rising. You could price a property based on recent sales, and we do show you how to do that in that course, um, and that's fine. But what does that mean if a property is on the market today versus yeah. a property that sold a month ago or two months ago? Now, that's a tough one because you have to work out how fast prices are rising in that area, and the way to really keep track of that is to actually have a spreadsheet, you know, and we, you and I do this in our business. Yep. We actually track um particularly in an auction area. So in, in our area, pro- properties are quoted at a price. So in an area where it's offered for at an asking price, you might put the initial asking price. Then you track the, the sold price and then you track the difference between the asking price and the sold price or the, the guide and the price guide and the sold price. So you can start to get a sense of, well, when, pro- when on average what agents are pitching as a sale price versus what actually happens. And then you can actually start tracking, well, that house that sold yesterday was very similar to one that sold six weeks ago and that's sold for five percent more or whatever and so once you actually start measuring that like for like you are going to be very very well educated in that market to be able to factor in your own premium so you know you're looking at recent sales and you think okay but however that was x amount of time ago and we can see evidence that there are uh, people are paying more for similar properties by a, you know a percentage increase. I'd apply that percentage increase to recent sales that compare with the property that you're looking at buying, and that's Great probably advice. the best way to do it. It and it has to be really, really recent. So by the time it hits you know advertised portals, it's probably a little bit old in this market. Um, it's it's talking to agents. It's gathering that information directly. What has sold unconditionally, even if it hasn't settled, it's valuable information that you can use. It also will help you understand when there's a change in the market. So if this is going along at 5% premium, 6% premiums, and then suddenly it becomes a, oh, that was pretty close to the quoted range or what it was worth based on data, you can actually pull you, you can start to say, well, maybe I don't have to pay that 4% premium. Let me just have a look at some other properties and see whether they're still getting a premium as well or was this just an anomaly? Yeah. Um, so looking for patterns, looking for changes in patterns, and that helps you keep on top of. And it kind of, it helps with this next question that Pip had as well, which is, aren't we basically forced to overpay in a market like this? And if we don't, what are the chances of getting lucky? Mm-hmm. Well, if you're monitoring it really, really closely and using this methodology, then you're really on top of what other people are doing, what they're paying, what the premiums are, and you will see firsthand if there's a change in that pattern. Measuring it is so important because the buyers that just throw their budget at it and give up, they're not measuring it. They're just panicking. Mm. So that's that's a massive difference and it gives you a lot of power and it, it, it can give you confidence to hold back. It also gives you confidence when you feel that the agent's bluffing you as well. You know, they might be bluffing you, they might not be bluffing you, but you get a yep. sort of more confidence around that. The other thing I'd add Knowledge to that. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Mm. It's just that we need much more current knowledge at the moment. Absolutely. And the other thing I would say is that be very careful about compromising on things that other buyers don't like. So <laughs> when a market is like this and prices are rising, it's time that people start buying on main roads, you know, because they go, oh, that's all, that's the only way I'm going to be able to afford to get in that market. Yeah. And I tell you what, when the market is slow, they won't touch that main road house with a barge pole. Which Very means hard that, to sell. Yeah, yeah, if you buy it and then you need to sell it, the market's slow, you're going to be trying to sell that for a long, long time, particularly in regional oh, areas. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. That's when people are looking for bargains, when so there's no pressure on price. When you push yourself, and you're going to have to in a, in a hot market, let's face it, you're going to have to push yourself. So make sure that you push yourself for a property that's a good property that isn't, and you're always going to have to compromise. It's just not compromising on those things that will hold it back in a slow market. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I'd rather have a smaller house in a better street than a big house on a main road. Um, yeah. And the scarcity factor, the Veronica, we bang on about the scarcity factor all the time. Um, you can buy units at the moment and not have a lot of price pressure because there is a lot of supply of two bedroom, two bathroom units in pretty much all capital cities. Mm. Um, that doesn't make it a good buy because 
if there's no scarcity now when there's scarcity, there's certainly not going to be scarcity when there's a lack of buyer interest. Um, so that that's a really risky one to to think very carefully about when you're thinking about compromises. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Pip also said she was listening to Tim Lawless giving his seven reasons for believing that the pace of growth might be showing signs of easing, but some degree of continued growth is expected for the next year at least. Assuming that's true, Pip asks, and she doesn't really see any reason to doubt it, it leaves her thinking that if $1 million won't get their revised dream home now, it certainly won't help us later. Good observation, Pip. Um, and, and, and it's true. It's that, it's that, do I sit on my hands and wait for prices to drop? No, that's certainly not what this, uh, what that, that, um, report was telling us. So her main question there is, am I missing something? Is there actually a reason for optimism? And is there a piece of the story that she hasn't considered? I love that question. <laughs> what don't I know? And is the question. Yeah, there's a lot that, you know, in buying a property, you don't know. There's a, a huge amount. And one of them is that there's no crystal ball. So even mm-hmm. though Tim Lawless has the benefit of loads and loads of um, research, loads yep. and loads of very smart people in his team to help mm-hmm. him come up with these forecasts. And he's very independent. So he is. He's, he's not aligned with, he's not trying to sell anything. He's, he's quite, you know, from that point of view, we quite like the, the validity of his data. Yeah, but still an interpretation, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And so, and things can go crazy and then wrong and haywire and up and it can be no wrong. No one predicted this one. In any, or in any number of ways. <laughs> so I think that there's a, there is a, um, there is a point and there are quite a lot of commentators that are saying this at the moment and that, and, and they're in agreement with Tim in saying that, yes, they can imagine that, that growth rate will slow, but it's not going to peak and I think what that says is that, that the mad frenzy that we've been experiencing, perhaps that will ease off a bit. And I'm actually sensing a little bit of it myself in the Sydney market. So that will, and what happens in Sydney and Melbourne in the big markets tends to have a ripple effect in other markets. Mm. There's no mm. doubt about that, but it yeah, can be absolutely. delayed. So mm. it's not necessarily mm. in the same time Next zone. that's going to happen there. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then, so we, we track a number of leading indicators. So some are actually saying that will happen. Others are saying it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, so I wouldn't be hanging my hat on that. And I think that that's where you're being very wise there, Pip. You're not saying, oh, mm. you know, oh, great. I'll wait, you know, because the reality is growth is still growth. Yeah. Even if it's not at a, big, you know, steep trajectory, if it's a slower growth, it's still growth. And so that should give you some opportunities to maybe make it an easier process and less frenetic, but it's still no reason to sit on your hands. Mm, it's not going to get cheaper is really what you're saying. So when, when you say, you know, we've got this rapid growth going like this, it's not going to peak and come off is is what we're sort of seeing in, in Tim's um, research. It's it's going to just Taper. slow. Now, a little bit Megan's like doing Brisbane. lovely things with her hands because she thinks everyone's watching the video. Because I think they like to look at us. <laughs> but, but if you're listening to this pod, as a podcast, she's, you know, she's making going up movements with her hand. It's going to remind me what we're doing. <laughs> now, Anyway, it won't peak and fall. It will peak and, and settle. Yeah. And then look, you know, ultimately it will overshoot and that some, some things will fall. And this is where it's, we go back to that buying quality property, not on May roads, for instance, because some of the, that sort of stock can and will lose money, you know, once the market peaks. So, so that is a definite uh, thing to be careful about. Um, she, so Pip's last question is, if I'm right about moving from FOMO to plain old Mo, <laughs> missing out, <laughs> which we don't think you should have to. We miss don't out, think you should be thinking Pip. like that, Pip. Um, yeah. What should you be thinking next? And and I guess what I'll be saying to you, Pip, is if you haven't done the Where to Buy workshop, this wasn't actually meant to be a big sales pitch for the Where to Buy workshop, but it is only thirty nine dollars after all. Do the Where to Buy workshop because that's a very structured way to go through that thinking process that Megan and I were just explaining around looking at your options, looking at the options for different types of property uh, or different you know levels of renovation, different size, et cetera, et cetera, and looking through your options around position or different locations. And then also looking at, well, do I have the opportunity to borrow a bit extra money um, and Will that make a difference? And it's through going through that process, you'll know where the answer to all those three questions, really. Yep. 
and and you'll know which one you're most comfortable with to, to compromise whether it is a villa rather than a house whether it is closer to the beach or further away whether it is um uh, in a different location or the tree change versus the sea change. Or it may be that you actually arrive at, at, at a decision that is we do need to spend a little bit more money, but don't increase your expectations if you increase no. your budget. <laughs> Big, big, big one to educate yourself to and give have a hard conversation with yourself. If you are looking to increase your budget, do not increase your expectations. That's exactly right. Folly in a rising market. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, we, we've t- touched on a number of things here. Uh, we've talked about the, um, the how to price a property. So there's a free mini course. We'll put the link in the show notes. We've talked about the where to buy workshop, which is really powerful to get you clarity around, you know, what your options are. We'll put the link to that in the in the show notes and it's as well. About you, it's not about you know. One thing that we we also are really passionate about is don't ever ask somebody where should I buy because they only have their own experiences, their own thoughts, and their own biases to draw on. This this tutorial is actually about you, your needs, and the decisions that you need to make, and where your compromises are, not somebody else's. So by all means gather ideas about different suburbs, but don't be influenced by other people. Make This is about a, a, a systematic methodical process to go through to arrive at your own decision that answers that question for you. Very true. Now, a couple of other workshops that we've been, we've been working on, um, we're working on a, a rent vest or occupy workshop, and that is to help people work through that process of should I buy to occupy all rent fest. Now that's not going to be our next workshop though, because we did run a poll and the we winner did. of our poll was the stepping stone strategy workshop. Very, very exciting. So rent vesting will have to wait. Um, <laughs> stepping stone strategy uh, workshop. We're holding one live, live. online, live online. online yeah, that's true. <laughs> it is live though. Really live. It's, it's, it's interactive. Yeah. Interactive. You get to ask lots of questions. Uh, we're holding it on Saturday, June the 19th, two o'clock in the afternoon. And we will put the link in the show notes too, in case you'd like to uh, take part in our Stepping Stone Strategy Workshop. It's live, interactive. You get asked and you get to ask questions. questions. There will be chat. Absolutely. Uh, but it, yeah, but it's uh, you're not going to come away with an answer, but you're going to come away with the right questions to ask, the right people to ask, the right process to go through so that you again can methodically work through that decision-making process. Absolutely. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff.